database applications. Now in the previous section we saw that applications typically include things like big data, data warehouses, data mods, business intelligence. So let's start off by looking at big data. Now this is a term that we hear more and more where we need to realize that we're living in a time and era where we are use, using and consuming quite a lot of information and data. Now, big data refer to the disc data collections that's very large and complex that our traditional database management systems and our hardware and all our analysis processes are incapable of dealing with. For example, you guys might have heard about things like smart cities, the Internet of Things, etc., where they indicate or estimate that in the future we have various devices and components being able to talk to each other. For example, if we live in smart cities or smart homes, we can typically go and control the interaction with that building or with our home by using our mobile devices over the internet. So your kettle, your fridge, your windows, your mirrors, your lights, everything can technically be connected to the internet. And then you can go and control that remotely. Now if we look at some other examples, they talk about smart healthcare, smart buildings, um, smart retail, and then various other examples. Now big data typically need to follow three major characteristics. Now just for interest sake, you would find on the internet that some people even talk about the eight characteristics. But we're going to focus on the top three, which amounts to volume, velocity and variety. Now volume comes down to the size of the actual database. Now what is the size? The size typically depends on the number of records that we want to write into that database. So if you think about your cell phone and your contact list, it, that would be considered to be a very small database. Whereas let's say you have roughly between 30, 40 people as contacts. In our big data databases, we're talking about millions of records per day or per minute. Velocity refers to the speed. How fast is this particular database? If you think about bigger databases such as Facebook, if it was very slow, people wouldn't have used those databases. So they need to be relatively fast and to ensure that there's proper communication between the various components and the various devices accessing their data. The third one is variety, which amounts to the formats. So in what format do we present the data? Is it going to be text? Is it going to be images? Is it going to be raw, unprocessed data? So we need to consider those things because later on, that's going to play a role when we need to start to analyze and process it as part of data analytics and perhaps business intelligence. Now, all data that we find in big data environments can be either structured or unstructured. Now, structured data is typically seen as all your well-defined and documented data, such as business transactions. So it's these things where we work with records and tables and we can, to the point, indicate what's happening with that data. Okay. On the other hand, we've got unstructured data. Now, again, we do find more and more of these. Now, these could be classified as any word processing documents, your email, social media, notes, etc. Typically, no guidelines forcing it to follow a particular path or particular structure. Now, when we talk about big data, we need to realize that it's tremendous amounts of data that's used within minutes and seconds. I don't know how many of you guys have heard of the Internet Minute. Now, this actually changes each and every year. For example, it's estimated that about $750 million is spent within one minute on the Internet that people watch around 70,000 hours, that 3.5 million searches are conducted in Google every minute, 
that there's 900,000 logins on Facebook, 16 million text messages, 4 million videos that are being viewed on YouTube, that 342,000 applications are downloaded, and that 46,000 posts are uploaded on Instagram. So it's quite a lot of information that's passing around the internet within a particular minute. Now, what do we do with that information and how do we save and record all of that information? So there's various challenges that we're going to experience. So when we talk about the challenges of big data, we need to consider what are the information that we want to save and where are we going to save that? So what's the subsets that we need to refer to? Where and how are we going to store that? How are we going to find the nuggets of relevant information from that in order to assist us with decision making? And perhaps most important, how do we derive value from that information to turn it into relevant information? Now, I can bet you when we talk about something like Facebook, we do typically find that nowadays there's a lot more ads and a lot more irrelevant irrelevant information that is added that you might not perhaps want to see in that environment so all of those things need to be recorded and it is somehow linked to your profile it might have been some concept that you googled or something that you watched in youtube so they think that it's now gaining popularity and it's part of your interest and they're going to show you more and more of that now we also need to mention in-memory databases now, in-memory databases is where the whole database or a subset of the database will be saved in your memory, your random access memory. Now, what did we know or what did we learn from topic number two, hardware? We know that our primary memory, such as RAM, is faster than our physical memory or our secondary memory where we're actually going to write it more permanently on our hard disks. So if the database is saved in RAM, whenever anything needs to be conducted or pulled out of that database, it is going to be much faster. Now we typically find that it allows you to have um, to better have a better analysis of your big data, and it's also going to perform better if we start to associate it with multi-core CPUs. So what types of data do we typically find in in-memory databases? Let's say for argument's sake you're a travel company or you're a courier company and you need to work with addresses. So you're referring quite a lot to street names and let's say postal codes. So instead of going to search for that every time from a physical hard disk location, by having it in memory, you can just send a request to memory, find the information you're looking for. It's absolutely milliseconds and you get that information back. Now let's move over to the next topic. The next thing that we need to refer to is known as data warehouses. Now a data warehouse can be defined as also as a large database that's going to collect a lot of business information from various sources and it ultimately needs to support the management with their decision making aspects. So if we look at the image we have data from various sources, so in this case, relational databases, working with something like SQL, having data from flat files, and having data in various other formats, such as spreadsheets. So all of that data would be sent through to our data warehouse, and then users can access that data in the data warehouse by performing query and analysis on that data. Now this whole process is also known as ETL, the Extract, Transform and Load process. So typically when we talk about data warehouses, people talk about the ETL process. So Extract means that it should take the information from the various sources, then it should transform that data, meaning that it needs to apply various rules and algorithms to determine what from that data do we want to go and save, and then the third step of this process is we need to load it into the warehouse. So if we look at ETL, E, extract the data that we have from the various sources. 
we're going to transform it and then the third one we're going to load it into our data warehouse which will subsequently allow people to go and access it perform their queries and then to get a visual representation of that data now when we talk about data warehouses we also need to talk about a data mart now a data mart is a subset of a data warehouse so a data warehouse can be very complicated containing a lot of information whereas with a data mart we can go and we can break it up into smaller sections for example our customer informational interactions versus our supplier interactions. so that can be two separate data marts so if we look at the definition it's a subset it's used by our small and medium-sized businesses and departments within our large companies and it also supports our decision making by having a specific area that we're going to focus on we will have greater level of access to our data and perhaps we'll have easier way of accessing the information that we need to look at now let's continue and look at the next definition business intelligence now business intelligence is a broad concept so it contains a range of technologies and applications which will allow organizations to transform their structured data in order to perform an analysis, to generate new information and to improve their decision-making processes within the organization. And business intelligence contains a few technologies such as data mining, online analytical processing, predictive analysis, data visualization as well as a comp competitive intelligence. Now let's go and look at each one shortly. Data mining is an information analysis tool that automatically go and discover patterns and relationships within our warehouse. So many people indicate that it provides you with a bottom-up discovery-driven analysis. So it's going to start right at the bottom of your information and work up to the types of decisions and patterns that you typically would need to assist you in making decisions the importance here is that we need to trust in the tools in order to allow it to go and uncover valid and worthwhile data for our different hypotheses the next definition or the next tool that we have is the online analytical processing or OLAP tool now this form of analysis allows individuals to explore data by accessing it from a number of perspectives and it's also known as slicing and dicing it provides us with a top-down query driven data analysis and it would also require us to be knowledgeable about the data and how it's used within our business for example if we're talking about slicing and dicing OLAP we can now go let's say for argument's sake and look at sales information in the company so we're going to say we want sales information within the western cape region find us the sales people with the most or the biggest sales percentages and then show the top products that they've sold within our company so it's technically information from various points but we're bringing it together in order to to get to better decisions the next tool or set of tools that we find is predictive analysis or also known as analytics which is a form of data mining where it combines historical data as well as assumptions about future conditions so if we look at sales we can try to determine which periods we would have better sales and which products might be perhaps more popular during certain periods so for argument's sake let's say we determine that during Christmas times people spend more on electronic devices and then we can start to focus on that the next tool that we find is data visualization now data visualization includes um, the analysis of our data in the form of charts and graphs and it allows us to see trends and patterns so it makes it a little easier and it also enables us to identify other possibilities or opportunities that we can use for future analysis now there's usually or there's actually a lot of software available that assists us with this such as excel and sas visual analytics and there's a bunch more so what do we find under data visualization we find things like social graph analysis 
key performance indicators as well as dashboards and we're going to look at these shortly now for social graph analysis it's a data visualization technique in which the data is represented as a lot of networks so you've got vertices where you've got individual data points which in most cases refer to your social network users and then the edges are the connections amongst these vertices for example if we jump to the next slide this is social graph analysis so something like facebook they can actually indicate or determine what people's interests are on facebook and how it relates from one person to another and what is the relationship between specific topics discussions products etc so a bunch of information and valuable information that they can actually go and detect and use now let's look at the next one key performance indicators or kpis now these are quantifiable measurements that assist the progress towards our organi organization achieving its goals and it reflects the critical success factors that a company needs to follow in order to achieve those goals so what do we need to do in order to be successful or to in or for or in order for us to perform the last two or subset that we find here is dashboards now dashboards typically in is typically combined with your key performance indicators and it's a data visualization tool that display the current status of our kpis in our organization so going back to our example this is typically what a dashboard looks like so it takes your information and it provides it to you in a more visual format for example if we look at something like travel travel distances that could be classified as a key performance indicator and immediately you can see how many miles or how many kilometers you've traveled in that particular instance so these we also do find more and more um, some of the major companies such as Microsoft Oracle all of those have their own views or representations of this now let's go and look at the last few definitions of this particular topic the competitive intelligence and counterintelligence. Now, competitive intelligence is all the information that we can gather about our competitors, including the ways that they work with their strategies, tactics, and operations. So, it's all the knowledge that we can gain from our competitors in order to make sure that we are trying to stay ahead of them. Now, with counterintelligence, we're actually looking at the steps that we take to protect our information from hostile intelligence gatherers for example on your mobile phone typically you find that people start to spam you they send you sms's which you haven't subscribed to or that they're starting to phone you selling your products etc etc so these things are usually where they've obtained your information somewhere else so counterintelligence would be you protecting your information, ensuring that they don't get access to your cell phone or your telephone numbers. Now at this stage, that is the end of topic number three, our databases. In the next section, we're going to talk about creating a database from scratch. So we're going to work through an example as well as look at some of the questions that you should be able to answer after you've completed this particular section.